Thank you for joining us this morning and throughout our fall Friends for Life week this week. My name is Marissa. I am CWD's clinical director. I have lived with type 1 diabetes for 32 years. I am a nurse and a clinical diabetes educator. And I have two kiddos and a dog, which hopefully you don't hear in the background through the presentation. I'm looking forward to, uh, to giving you this information about getting insulin into the body and tips and tricks that uh, hopefully will help you in your diabetes journey. So I will go ahead and get started. If anyone has questions, feel free to ask them throughout the presentation, either in the chat feature or in the Q&A. And then we will go through the questions at the end of the presentation. So today we're, I'm going to talk about getting insulin into your body, talking about all the different types of infusion sets, about rotating your infusion sets or your injection sites, and more of the common issues that people with diabetes tend to experience. I'd like to th say thank you so much to our sponsors for helping us celebrate World Diabetes Week. And uh, we are at the last, tomorrow is the last day for our donations. If you can uh, give a donation, you can scan to donate or check out the website at cwd.is backslash 100 years. I believe we need about 25 individual donations left. We're almost there and then we can get a $25,000 gift. So I wanted to start this out because all of us are in this club that we really never asked to join. And, uh, you know, for better or for worse, we're here. And I just thought it was this was a pretty funny uh, way of thinking about it. So uh, and then I'll show you. So what we're going to discuss today, we're going to talk about multiple daily injections, about insulin pumps, inhaled insulin, different types of syringes, uh, pen needles. We'll talk about smart pens a little bit. We'll talk about um, the patch pump and types of infusion sets, skin, uh, site rotation and lipohypertrophy, and then common skin challenges. And thanks, Rebecca. I really like that meme as well. So insulin only works when you get it into the body properly. And whether or not um, this has happened to you, there are so many different things that, you know, either I've personally experienced or I've heard other people experience. And it's, it's really frustrating when, you know, you're already trying to manage something that is pretty challenging. Um, and, you know, you just don't get it in properly for whatever reason. And I think a lot of people that use insulin pumps, you know, we have infusion sets that just seem to stop working at some point and it gets pretty frustrating. Um, you know, and so let's talk about how, how to get things into the body, how to get insulin into the body properly. Uh, I wish we all looked as happy as this woman as she gets ready to inject herself. So as far as inhaled insulin, I'll go through this in a minute, but it is currently only available in rapid acting. And that's because when you inhale it, it goes into your lungs and gets into your bloodstream pretty quickly. So it works quickly and then it leaves quickly. And then, you know, as far as injections, you can do syringe with vials, which, um, you know, was really the only option for people with diabetes for a really long time. And then insulin pens, which can be a little bit more convenient. And um, I think some insulins actually only even come in pens now. And then you use the pen tips. And then for insulin pumps, I think sometimes people get started on the pump with a certain infusion set, and you may not realize that there are different options for you. Um, the patch pump right now is only at an angle, but there are angled soft cannulas, straight um, soft cannulas, and then there's a straight steel needle, which sounds scarier than it actually is. So why, what, what area of the body are we looking to get our insulin into? So ideally, we want to get insulin into the subcutaneous tissue is what it's called. You don't want to go into the muscle because that will also get absorbed more quickly. And um, it then will also doesn't react the same way. So the subcutaneous tissue is what you're looking for. So where is your injection real estate or infusion set real estate? Typically it's anywhere that you can pinch an inch of subcutaneous tissue. Some of us have more real estate than others and that's okay. And you can make it work for whatever body type you have or for your child. 
Um, you do want to avoid any scar tissue, uh, breast tissue, and about an inch around the belly button, as you can see in this image here. But there are a lot of options, the back of the arm, the abdomen, the upper buttocks, the thighs. We, we have lots of options, and you can get creative. So injection or infusion site rotation is extremely important. And, you know, as I said, I've been living with type one for 32 years. I have been wearing a pump uh, for 23 years. So that's a really long time that I've had something attached to my body, just trickling insulin in. And that for me has caused a lot of scar tissue buildup. And, you know, one of the biggest problems with scar tissue is that when you put insulin into it, it reacts really unpredictably. So it might absorb more quickly, more slowly, and then you might all of a sudden get this like influx of insulin from what you injected into the scar tissue. And, you know, diabetes is hard enough uh, as it is baseline. So adding these extra variables makes it just really, it feels defeating, I think, um, and can become really frustrating. So there are so many different patterns that you can use to, to work on your site rotation or injection rotation. Um, something that I have been doing for at least the last decade, um, which is something that um, I was taught by a nurse practitioner when I was working in Tampa, and she said to split my body in half, left and right, and rotate only on that side of my body for 30 days, because then I get a 30 day break for the other side of my body for it to hopefully the scar tissue to dissipate a bit. Um, and what I do is I do this method on the right here, um, which is the planting the seed method. So it's like I'm planting seeds in a little garden um, and it can be, it can be pretty easy because for me, you know, when I remove my infusion set, I can see sort of the red, you know, I have a little bit of a red bump after I remove it and it goes away within about a day or two. Um, but then I move about a, a half inch away from that uh, for my next infusion set. But it honestly doesn't matter what type of rotation you're doing, but it matters that you're not that you're actually doing something consistently and you're not just going from, from one side of your abdomen to the other, because that's how we used to do it. That's how we used to be taught um, even when I, you know, when I was younger. But the problem with doing that is you end up picking like favorite spots without even realizing it. And they become favorite spots quickly for injections or infusion sets because you start to not feel them, but that's because you're developing scar tissue. So you know, when you, when you feel it go in and you're like, oh, I wish I didn't feel this. You should be grateful that you feel it. <laughs> and it means you're in a good spot in theory. Um, and so, you know, if you're struggling with types of patterns, you can do something like the first letter of your name, of your first name. So like you could do an M um, for Marissa, but just pick something that works for you. And, and again, you know, the reason that this is something that's so important and it's honestly, un, it's not talked about a lot. Um, I hope, hopefully when you go see your, your doctor or your nurse practitioner, whoever you see for diabetes, um, diabetes educator, they are taking a look at where you take your injections or put your infusion sets. Um, but I think it's pretty, it, to me, I haven't had a whole lot of experience with people feeling, you know, the parts of my body that I inject. Um, but hopefully they do because what you want to watch out for are these things called lipohypertrophy, which is where you get extra lumps of fat or scar tissue that form under the skin. And it can become pretty severe if you don't know what you're looking for. And I'll show you a picture on the next screen. And I don't, I'm not trying to use this as a scare tactic. I just personally have seen people that have had this and I, I don't want it to happen to anyone else. So I hope it prevents you from um, having this issue. And then there can also be something called lipoatrophy which is where the opposite sort of happens and you tend to lose fat and get these indentations um, under your skin. And they're both caused from repeated injections in the same location. So again, if you can find a rotation pattern that allows your different parts of the body to rest, it can be really helpful. Um, I used to do something, you know, when I was younger and wore bikinis in the summer, I would use my, my hips uh, for my, or my upper buttock for my infusion sets in the summers and then let them rest in the winter so that my sight wasn't on my skin and I didn't get those awesome uh, infusion set tan lines. But now I'm an adult and I actually don't care. <laughs> um, 
And again, you know, talking about the absorption issues, uh, you know, if I have a high blood sugar, my, my theory is as someone who's lived with this for a long time, I want it to be because I had a really good cookie or something. I don't want it to be because my insulin didn't get absorbed properly, like make it worth it. <laughs> so again, I, I hope I'm not trying to be, you know, obscene or, you know, um, you know, use scare tactic or anything, but I have seen people with this um, on the left and it's like affectionately called like belly boobs, which is really, um, really sad. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to have these extra hunks of skin um, where you don't want them. And again, they're just not useful for, uh, for insulin. Um, I will say for scar tissue, if you have scar tissue, it's actually great for CGM. So if you wear a continuous glucose monitor, um, a sensor, it, the, they work really well in scar tissue and it doesn't create the same kind of scar tissue that, uh, insulin pumps or infusion sets or, um, or injections do because it's not infusing insulin. It's just inserted once just sitting there. So that's a really good way to, to make use of your scar tissue. Should you have it? And, um, if you do happen to have any of the uh, like lipohypertrophy or dis or atrophy, you want to avoid that area from for at least six months, but maybe a year, and have it reevaluated from your healthcare team to make sure that you know the tissue has gone back to normal before you start using it for insulin again. So, just a quick note on inhaled insulin, uh, because this is something that is is a, a cool option for some of us living with diabetes. They are, they're doing the pediatric studies right now. So um, it has not been approved in kids yet, but hopefully it will. Um, and this is something that, you know, avoid avoiding site rotation problems. Um, and it's, it's just an interesting way of, of doing diabetes. So it works faster, as I mentioned before, than um, the typical injected insulin. And, um, you know, it would be great if we could just take a pill of insulin, of course, and I, I meant to say this at the beginning, but unfortunately, because of the way the insulin molecule is, if it's taken as a pill or ingested, the stomach acid breaks it down. Um, so it's just not that easy, unfortunately. So um, again, I think that inhaled insulin is a really interesting way of, of doing things. And some people are using it sort of in, in um, adjunctive therapy with their normal, like uh, multiple daily injections or infusion sets, and they will use it for either just mealtime insulin, or they'll use it for just corrections. Um, I think, you know, diabetes is such an individualized disease that you need to do what works for you and, and get creative and think outside the box and find ways to, to manage, um, manage your diabetes and give you a good quality of life. So it's actually a really small device, which you can see in this picture here. And the little sort of teal colored thing is the, the cartridge. So what you do is you have that inhaler and then you get different cartridges. And, and right now that comes in meter dosing in four unit increments, which sounds like a lot, but again, it works a little bit differently than the way that it is injected. And it, it's, it's not as, um, it's not as aggressive as you would think it is. Um, but, you know, talking to your healthcare team about this as an option and, you know, maybe they'll have samples at their office, uh, is a really great idea just for a, a different technique. And then multiple daily injections. So this is a really great option for uh, people who, you know, either, you know, wearing an insulin pump doesn't seem like it works for them, or, um, you know, they want to use less equipment, uh, you know, whatever it is. There, there's pros and cons to each of these management techniques. And again, you really need to find what works best for you and your family. Um, so syringe and vial, it's just the good old fashioned, um, simple, you, you need to have a syringe and a vial. And for, for now, most insulins come where the long acting is in one vial or, or one pen. And then the, uh, fast acting is in another, there are a couple of, um, split mixed pens is what it's called. Um, but Oh yeah, that I see your comment, Rebecca. That is not a that is not an insulin syringe <laughs> in that photo. Um, don't worry, you don't have to use that big of a needle. Um, and um, so, so I think the other thing is like pen and pen tips can be nice because they are 
um, they're also convenient and you don't need a lot of equipment. Like for an insulin pump, you know, if you need a new infusion set, you can carry a new infusion set, but if you need insulin, you have to carry like the infusion set, the insulin, the cartridge or reservoir. It's kind of a lot of stuff. Um, and that's not for everybody. Um, and then smart pens are really cool because they will do different things depending on which smart pen you use, but they can keep track of when you last took your insulin. They can actually tell you based on the last time that you use the pen, how much insulin is still active in your system. Because the fast acting insulins that we take typically last, you know, three to five hours in the body, depending on, um, on your, what your body does and how, how quickly it absorbs it, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, of course there's an option of doing you know, injection for long acting and inhaled for meals or, you know, some sort of combination of any of these items. So there's different uh, gauges and I will, I wanted to explain this a little bit because it's, it sounds, it seems a uh, counterintuitive, but the bigger the number for a gauge is the uh, thinner the needle will be. So I, on average, uh, most people use uh, the size of a needle of four millimeters, which is pretty small, and it's plenty to get insulin into that subcutaneous tissue. Um, Sometimes if you have used a, like a four millimeter length for a long time and you're having some insulin resistance or you feel like maybe your absorption is not as well, um, it going as well as it usually was, you can change to a longer length just to get into a different area of that tissue. And you can do the same with infusion sets just to uh, you know, switch things up a little bit and, and get better absorption. Um, and, you know, syringes, typically they come in like 30 units, 50 units, or 100 units. Um, and I will say that these, you know, these needles that we are using are really supposed to be single use. They are not designed uh, like the old syringes where, you know, they were boiled and, you know, reused. Um, this being said, you know, if, if there's not a way, if you don't have access to um, syringes and pen needles for whatever reason, like maybe, maybe, uh, you know, you're getting your prescription tomorrow, you know, you have, still need to get the insulin into your body. So do what you need to do. But, um, I will caution that, um, as I shared on that screen earlier with problems with getting insulin into the skin, uh, we have definitely heard, um, of needles breaking off in the skin, which would just really be a bad day. So hopefully you have access to getting them, uh, through your pharmacy. Um, and then smart pens. So, so as I mentioned, some of them are, are sort of simple. There's, there's one called capsulin where you can just put this cap onto most normal pens and it'll just display the, the last time that that pen was used, which is a great option for, um, long acting because then, you know, you can make sure like, oh, did I take my, my Traceva, my Lantus, whatever it is, you know, and then you, it'll show you um, when it was last taken. Um, and then there are some that can help, you know, keep track insulin on board. And with an app on the phone can even, you can put in your settings, like your insulin to carb ratios, your correction factors, and it can help give you suggested dosing so that um, you don't have to do all those calculations inside your head. Um, and that the one that does that I right now, I believe is in pen. Um, and I can give you more information on that. Okay, so we talked a lot about, um, you know, multiple daily injections and what options you have. Now I want to switch gears a little bit to insulin pumps. And, and again, you know, insulin pumps are not for everybody. I, I really believe that you need to find what you are comfortable with. Um, I have worn an insulin pump since I was 11. I, I like to try all of the different systems. Um, and I'm really fortunate because I work in diabetes and um, I worked in diabetes research for a little while and got to try, you know, some of the, the hybrid closed loop systems before they came to market. Um, and uh, I just think it's a really it's an interesting experience to be able to try different things. And I had never actually tried multiple daily injections because at the time when I was 11, um, it was really just NPH and regular. And, you know, you draw like, I think clear before cloudy. <laughs> I don't even remember, but you had to, you know, it was syringe and vial. 
um, two shots a day, you ate at the same time every day. It was very regimented. And, and my motivation for getting an insulin pump at 11 years old was I wanted to sleep in and not have to wake up to take my insulin. Um, and, and I think, you know, for me, insulin pumps can add a bit of flexibility. And I think for, for kids, especially when um, you don't know exactly how, like how much they're going to eat, what they're going to eat and, you know, when they're going to have start running around in circles, which my kids did this morning, <laughs> um, must be nice to have that kind of energy, but, um, you know, having, having flexibility and have, and being able to also do things like extended boluses for high fat meals, like pizza, um, things like that. It, it really, I really personally enjoy it. And I did, I did try multiple daily injections, uh, I think about six years ago. Um, and I did like it in, in certain ways, but for me, I, I still really just love having an insulin pump and that's, you know, You've got to do what's right for you. Like I said, so I've also tried all the different types of infusion sets because, you know, I want to be able to talk to people about my, you know, how they work, my experiences with them. And, um, currently I am using a, a soft cannula nine 90 degree insertion. Um, but there are also a 30 degree insertion. So it goes in at an angle and it's a little bit longer, but it's not going in you know, that deep under the skin. So don't let the 13 millimeters scare you. Um, and these you will change every three days, three to four days, depending on, um, you know, what your healthcare team recommends for you. And if you tend to get infusion site, uh, sensitivities or reactions, um, and then the 90 degrees, they come in either six millimeters or nine millimeters. And then there's the steel needle. And again, I think, I mean, for me, when I heard, when I went onto a pump, it was either the 30 degree, like long insertion or steel needle. And I was like, yeah, I'm not putting a needle in me all day long. Cause it sounds like terrifying. Um, but I have to tell you, I have used these a lot and I started using them, uh, when I was going to get, or when I was pregnant actually, because they don't kink. Right. And so when I was pregnant and I had to have extremely tight control, I did not want to risk having a kinked infusion set because it just didn't feel like it was worth the stress for me. Um, and the other thing is that uh, sometimes they're much easier to insert because you just literally like plop it in um, and they come in either a six millimeter or an eight millimeter. But, you know, one of the big downsides is it's, you're supposed to change it every two days, which is a little, you know, more work than we want to do, I think. <laughs> so um, for the infusion sets that are 90 degrees um, and soft cannula. Oh, and yes, thank you, John. The, the um, steel needle has a pigtail and I have a slide on that and I can talk more about that when I get up there. Thank you. Um, recommended day or where is three to four days. Um, I will tell you. So at, when I was working in diabetes research, um, at Stanford with the, um, artificial technology or pancreas team, um, one of the things that one of the physicians there, Dr. Buckingham said, based on the studies that he has done with infusion sets is it really seems like there are just some people who are lucky and can wear infusion sets for five and six days and have normal blood sugars and not have problems. And then there are people like me who at like day two and a half, just hang out above 150 and you're like, Ugh. and so, you know, part of the, part of the challenge here is you can't really like give a skin sample comfortably to figure out how your body reacts to, to and how, how your scar tissue is formed. Um, there are studies that are being done um, in pigs primarily about how, you know, how scar tissue is formed and what um, sort of what infusion sets are, create the least amount of scar tissue. And, um, but again, these are just, sort of random interpersonal, uh, changes or, you know, variabilities. So just, you know, making sure that if you are keeping infusion sets in longer than is recommended, that you're not getting any infections, um, you know, having a red swollen or, you know, yellow oozing or, uh, inflammation around the area, you know, those kind of things, you really want to keep an eye out for those things and, and of change them more frequently if you're experiencing those issues or if you're experiencing high blood sugars 
um, at the end of the few days. Um, and so six millimeter or nine millimeter are the options for um, insertion length and you know whatever dependent on your body type and um, your scar tissue that you have. Um, again, I switched to nine millimeter for a while uh, just to sort of get to a little bit lower area of skin and it helped me with my absorption. And then I switched back to six millimeter after I let it rest for a few months, which was great. Um, yeah, and you don't have to like stay on one infusion set forever. You just need to change it with, uh, change the prescription with your healthcare team and then they can send you. And actually you can get like one box at a time if you wanted to try a different type of infusion set. And if you don't wanna have to purchase a box, you can also um, ask your local pump representatives. So like the pump trainers or like the sales reps because they typically have, um, you know, each type of infusion set, and they should be able to give you a couple of, of samples. Your doctor's office might have it also, but um, that's another way of getting, you know, getting these things to try. So the 30 degree insertion um, soft cannulas, you know, these are ideal if you have very little body fat, um, which I think is a real challenge for some people and, and some young kids. Um, I know this is, was a challenge for me when I was 11, um, but having the 30 degree infusion set allows you to, to use more, uh, real estate despite not having a copious or even great amounts of subcutaneous tissue. And these are also recommended wear for three to four days. Um, typically they're only 13 millimeters, but Medtronic does have a 17 millimeter. And there are some people that they've been using that infusion set forever and they, they want it. And so I'm glad that they kept that for them. Um, most of the, most of the infusion sets, and I guess I should have said this about the 90 degree, but most of them are, um, inserted with like an insertion device. So in this picture, I mean, this insertion device that he's using is actually for a sensor. Um, but there'll be something that helps it go in quickly. And then when you uh, remove the insertion device, the needle comes out and then the cannula stays in the body. Um, however, for the, the 30 degree, there is still the, um, the old, which is, this is what I was started on was the silhouette or comfort. There's a couple of different uh, names for it where you can manually insert. Um, and some people, you know, just don't feel comfortable having an automatic inserter, they want to be able to, um, you know, put it in slow and steady or however they do it. Um, but for me, I love having an automatic inserter. And thank you, Peter, I've been corrected. So that is the inserter for the new quick sets, it looks like. Um, and I will say I have anecdotally, I have heard a lot of people who manually put in quick sets have issues with it kinking. Um, and I don't know if anyone, if anyone on here has experienced that or maybe have experienced the opposite, um, but I, I know that the quick sets you can manually put in, but I, I, have, I have heard a lot of different people say that they have more kinking um, problems or infusion sets going bad without using the inserter. Um, yeah, and Peter's saying he did it once in an emergency and doesn't recommend it. Yeah, I agree. And so steel needle. Um, and so I, there was some, some talk in the chat, um, I think between Peter and John about, you know, some discomfort with sleeping. And I will agree with that. You know, I think if you, if you get pushed on where the steel needle is, it doesn't feel great. And actually that's the reason that I stopped wearing it is because when my kids uh, were toddlers, uh, they would jump on me a lot. And every once in a while, they would step right on the infusion set. And I'm going, oh, like, <laughs> um, but again, like I used it my entire pregnancy uh, with my son and it was great because I never had to worry about having a high from an infusion set. And I, I think I had at the beginning, I had like two bad infusion sets and I went above 250 and I was like, nope, I can't do it. Cause it's just, you know, I don't, you don't want to risk it for, for pregnancy, but, um, you know, recommended wear is, is two days. And, um, I think as John mentioned, I don't know if, yeah, John about the pigtail. So the way that the steel and steel needle infusion set works is there's this, there's a piece and I wish I, I'm sorry, I didn't include a picture. There's a little piece 
that has um, the steel needle that you just plop in and you don't, honestly, you don't feel it if you just plop it in, it's great. Um, and that can be good for kids who are, are more um, anxious with, or people in general who are more anxious with like the clicking sound of the inserted infusion sets. Um, and then it has a little like, I think it's like a two and a half inch tubing that connects to a, uh, just sits on top of the skin, but plastic connector piece that is similar to the other infusion sets. And the reason that they did that is because they wanted to hook the tubing up uh, not directly on top of the needle so that you don't have to like move the needle to hook up your tubing to the pump. Um, and it actually works really well. And the other thing that's pretty nice about this infusion set is there are, um, you know, people, including myself, who get caught on handles with my tubing every once in a while, or like kids who are extremely active and um, get their tubing caught on things. And it's nice because if you rip off that like pigtail part, it doesn't rip out the steel needle part. So you can put like extra tape on top of the, um, the steel needle portion as an extra precautionary method. Um, and then again, you know, this is also a really great, it's like the easiest to insert. So, you know, for people that have maybe, you know, issues with their, with dexterity, like with being able to feel their fingers, um, you know, for older people, it can be, it can be really helpful. And it's also often what uh, is used for people who are starting insulin pumps. And then patch pumps. So right now there is only one patch pump available and it is Omnipod. And it is a 45 degree insertion with a, a six and a half millimeter soft cannula. And what's kind of cool about this is that instead of um, you know needing to do an insertion device and things like that, you you ins you just put the pod on wherever it's going to be worn, and then you tell it to insert the uh, cannula, and it'll do it automatically. Puts it in, pulls the needle back out, leaves the cannula in, um, and so sometimes. I think it can be a little bit less uh, traumatizing for people who are newer to pumping, people with needle phobia, because you never see the needle at all. Um, however, I would recommend um, some distraction <laughs> when you're doing the, the change process the first couple of times, because it does do this like click, click, click thing that um, can, can also be, you know, you get that anxiety of anticipation. Um, but this is, a great option um, because it doesn't have any tubing. Um, and a lot of parents really like this for remote bolusing because you bolus from a PDM, which um, you know is like just a little separate device, like a handheld. Hopefully it'll be just an app on the phone one day, but you know, we're not there yet. Um, and uh, you know, these can also be worn, you know, three to four days, depending on your, your skin type um, and how much insulin you use, et cetera. And there's a little girl with her Omnipod all decorated. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about skin challenges because this is something that I think most of us with diabetes have experienced at, at, at one time or another with either infusion sets, continuous glucose monitors, et cetera, and, um, and or the pods. So Often people, especially in the summer or, um, you know, people that play a lot of sports are really active, have problems with their infusion sets coming off easily. And there are definitely options. So you can use liquid glue like skin tack. Um, you can use additional tapes. Um, there are a lot of options for keeping things attached to you, which is great. And my uh, personal favorite is a tape called Hypothix, and I guess I should put it in the chat. It's um, a hypoallergenic tape. So, um, because for me, I have had some sensitivity to um, some of the some of the overlays that are sent um, with my continuous glucose monitor. So I tend to use Hypothix, which you can get like in a giant roll. You just cut it to whatever shape you need. Um, you can use. Tegaderm, you can use band-aids in a pinch. I've done that a lot of times. <laughs> Whatever you have around, any kind of medical tape. Um, and then, you know, the opposite problem, which, which um, there was a woman the other night 
thinking about or talking about her daughter um, and how how challenging the um, Dexcom is to come off of her arm. Um, and this can be really um, difficult and it can be really challenging for um, for little kids, especially. Um, so if it doesn't come off easily and is painful, you can get things like detach all. Um, which is like the opposite of liquid glue. And um, you can also try like baby oil. And there are also, you can try barrier wipes or you can use different like tapes underneath. The, the, the thing that I will say with using like a, like a tegaderm, which is like a clear tape, is you don't want to like insert the tegaderm into your body. So you wanna cut a little hole out where the actual um, infusion set will go in. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, playing with different things and seeing what works best for you is really the best way to, to determine. Um, and then if you are someone who gets really sensitive, um, gets, you know, irritation, gets rash under the adhesive, um, you know, trying things like barrier wipes, uh, there's something called a uh, Cavalon wipes, um, which is made for ostomies originally, which stay on the body for a really long, like a longer period of time, um, typically. And, um, Oops, and that, that can be really helpful, or you can use a physical barrier. And then the other thing, oh yes, tough pads. Thank you, John. I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking there's something that people use and I couldn't remember what it was called. Thank you so much. Um, and then there's also, a, people have discovered um, that Flonase, um, which is like an over the, I, I don't know if it's over the counter, I think it is, um, nasal spray. Um, you can actually spray that on your skin and it tends to help um, decrease the irritation. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that some adhesives uh, we have learned over the past few years, basically, that uh, it has like wheat in it. So people with celiac would have um, more reactivity to certain tapes, but because of how um, sort of common celiac is in the type one diabetes world, um, a lot of the companies have worked to remove the any sort of wheat contaminants in from their tapes. Um, I know Dexcom changed their tape a couple years ago. I know Omnipod just changed theirs. So hopefully we're not experiencing it those as much. And then bottom line, you know, doing what's what works for you and your family and trying different things out for and figuring out what you like best. And I've seen a couple things in the chat about, you know, trying different things at different times or like mixing and matching and, and just you know, it doesn't have to be uh, like a forever, like, oh, you're on a pump now and you wear this 90 degree infusion set and this is you forever. Like there's not many things in life where that, where uh, you stay with one thing forever. It's always usually um, life is ever changing. So I hope that you can find some things that work for you. And oh, I wish this meme looked a little better. It's very blurry, but this is just a, a fun, like when you see someone in public with a sensor an infusion set or a pump, uh, I am definitely one of those that gets really excited and says hello. And I, <laughs> I don't know how you all, you all are. Um, so thank you. And now um, I would like to go through the questions and it looks like we have some already in the Q&A. So thank you all for, for listening and for participating. I really love having all the interaction. So, so okay, so Peter has asked, he's recovering from an infection, uh, from an infusion set, and um, he can feel the scar tissue about the size of a nickel or dime. Is the area lost forever or will he be, or will you ever be able to use that area again? And it's where he really likes to wear his infusion sets. Um, so I'm wondering if you are recovering from an infection, it may not be scar tissue. It may be like uh, irritation and swelling from the infection that you're having. And it might just be that it's not quite dissipated yet. So I would give it another couple of weeks. Um, I would say if it gets worse, if you're having increase in swelling, redness, warmth, any kind of um, oozing goo, um, follow up with your doctor right away and see if you need to get on an antibiotic. But I would say you might just need some more healing time and I would expect that that will dissipate. Um, and even when you get scar tissue, uh, it, it's not a forever lost situation. Typically, uh, typically you need to give it about six months to a year 
to rest, which is a long time. And this is when, um, you know, when I start to notice that I am getting scar tissue, I like to get creative and try my infusion sets in different places. Um, and so what I, you know, what I've done is I've tried, um, you know, the 30 degree on my thighs. Um, I tried that during diabetes camp, which probably was a poor choice because what I noticed is like every time I went walking, I would drop real fast. Um, but this allows you time to get creative and try different locations on your body that you might not have tried before. So I think thinking of it as an opportunity um, could be a really positive experience. And I hope that it, it resolves for you. Um, and so Rebecca is asking, can you use inhaled insulin if you're congested? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I would assume it's yes. However, I would say if you have like a lot of gunk in your lungs that you, I, I'm not sure if you'd want to add anything else into that. Um, and I, I will have to do some research to find the answer to that question. If anyone on here knows the answer, please feel free to type it into the chat. Um, because it's my, my concern would be if you have congestion in your lungs and then you're adding, you know, the inhaled insulin, would it change the absorption of the insulin? Um, but there's kind of only one way to find out. <laughs> um, anyway. Okay. And then I can see if a Fresa has anything on their website about that, Rebecca, I'll take a look. Um, and then can smart pens do half units? I believe that they can, I think, you know, different pens can do half units. I can take a look. Let me look on the in pens website. Hold on. Okay. I'll take a look while I'm answering the next question. Um, okay. And have you ever heard of insulin resistance going up the longer a pump is on? My four-year-old son uses an Omnipod and we've noticed about 12 hours before time to change the pod, his insulin resistant rises and his blood sugar goes high. But when we change the pod, his blood sugar gets better. It doesn't matter which site we use. So Julie, I am wondering if that, it sounds like your son might have sort of similar to what I experienced, where as I get towards the end of my infusion set life, um, I think what happens is my body just starts to like, you know, you know, you're, I mean, you're have something in your body that's not normal. And so your body is probably trying to, you know, his body's probably trying to go check it out. And like, maybe it's like trying to, um, even recover the, the damage from the insertion itself. Cause there is a little bit of damage, right. That we're doing. Um, and it's, you know, risk benefit thing. Like, I think it's worth it. I love wearing my pump. Um, but I, it sounds like you might need to just change his pods earlier, but he's four. So that sounds like it might be really hard to do that. Um, the other and it said, you said, how long is, I wonder how long has he been on a pump? Um, the other thing that I have found, which is very random, is my infusion sets last longer when I personally use Novolog versus Humalog. And I've heard other people say the opposite. So the <laughs> diabetes is so weird, you guys. Um, so sometimes people's bodies work better with different types of insulin, whether it's, you know, Admalog, whether it's Novolog, Humalog, um, Apidra, whatever it is. So I, I would honestly think maybe if you could try the, um, a different type of insulin that you're using, um, I think that I think that that might be the answer, which is pretty random, but it, it seems to be something that I experienced very, um, very often. And I even tried to go back to Humalog again a couple of years ago, because I was like, oh, that's like the same thing. How could this be the problem? Um, and I ended up, um, I ended up putting it back, going back to Novolog and I have to get like a prior authorization and all that nonsense. But um, I don't have the same issue as often with uh, Novolog. And I see Julie said he's been on the Omnipod for nine months and uses Admalog and you've only recently started having issues. Yeah, I would say you can try changing the, the pod earlier. Um, if he's not, if it's more than like three or four days, um, sometimes people need them every two days. And then also just seeing if you can try a different insulin, you may be able to get a sample vial of insulin from your healthcare team. Um, which could be helpful. 
And then I saw someone answered earlier, thank you, Karen, that the in-pen does have units. Thank you. Um, and let's see. Oh, and so John was saying that he thinks that the humalog tends to crystallize in the tubing more than Novolog, which maybe that's what I'm experiencing. But I have, I have absolutely heard other people say the exact opposite, that that humalog works better for them. So um, I wish I could give you a very straight answer, but diabetes doesn't like to give us those. Um, and I see, Peter, you're just healing now. Uh, yeah, I hope that it heals. Um, okay, and then there's one more question about um, do from Rebecca, do prep wipes like IV prep and skin prep include a disinfectant or should you use alcohol? And does that answer apply to things like skin tack as well? So I, IV prep and skin prep are, I believe they have um, like alcohol in them. Um, I, but skin tack I think is just glue. Um, and I have to tell you that my um, recommendation and I should have included this in my slides, for if you are sensitive skin wise, um, I would recommend before you change um, any type of infusion set or put any adhesive on your body that you uh, wash the skin with soap and water, not use alcohol. And, and the reason that I recommend that, and also you want to use a soap that is um, sort of uh, like not very moisturizing, like you want to use something like Dial, not something like the Dove bars that are really moisturizing because then the, <laughs> the tape doesn't always stick as well. Um, but soap and water versus alcohol can, is much less irritating on the skin. Um, so I, I do my best to not put my sensors in until after I shower, um, because then I know I'm at least like as clean as I'm going to be for the next 10 days <laughs> before I put it in. Um, cause 10 days is a long time. Um, so Oh, and best case for naked showers. I know there's like such a real like feeling of being actually naked when you wear so many uh, devices. Like we're all bionic at this point. Um, it's so, it's so strange. It's like unnerving. I think sometimes I'm like, where's all my stuff? <laughs> um, um, and it looks like John said that um, IV prep has alcohol, but skin prep does not. So that's good to know. So skin prep is just the barrier and you should be able to read on the packet or the box that it comes in. Um, and if you're having a hard time finding different things like that, you know, the, the best place to get those kind of things, if you're not getting them online, which is what I do because I'm lazy, um, is going to like a pharmacy supply store. Um, so they have lots of options in pharmacy supply stores. They might not have as many options in like the Walgreens or CVS pharmacies, but the, if you have a pharmacy supply store, and if you look that up, you should be able to find one in your area. Um, and then I was just going to address, yeah, Rebecca said she's allergic to Novolog and it's really frustrating, uh, but she's found that Epidra, Fiasp, or Fiasp and Lumjev are good options too. Yeah, there are, there are people, um, one of our, our youth uh, faculty and um, staff, Jen Hansen, um, she has an, an allergy to the diluent, like what Novolog puts in all of their products and she gets a rash and she's like tried multiple times to like rule it out because she really wanted to use their um, long acting insulin because it lasts longer. It has a better shelf life, et cetera. Um, and um, it's just, it gives her a rash every time. And I think it's really interesting because I've met a lot of healthcare professionals that are like, oh, insulin allergies aren't, you know, they're not real or whatever. And I'm like, you know, everybody has something. And um, sometimes it happens that you will, that you do have an allergy. And, and what I would say there is, you know, be an advocate for yourself. And if you're concerned that you are having an issue with whatever diabetes thing you're having an issue with, um, trust your gut and, and moms too, of kids, trust your gut and, um, you know, advocate for yourself with your, with your healthcare professional. Yeah, and Rebecca saying, tell that to my super red puffy sites that take two to three weeks to fade. Ugh, that sounds terrible. Um, and then John was asking if I know anyone who has an insulin allergy that has used a steroid mixed into their insulin. I have not heard of that. Usually you just switch to like a different brand and then hopefully your like dilution is a little bit different. Um, and then I'm just going back up because I missed a comment earlier for Peter, for those of us that fall victim to doorknobs, et cetera. Oh, I've had this problem so much. Um, 
some are better than others. And he was saying that silhouettes seem to be the easiest to accidentally yank out. Interesting. Um, and this is one of advantage to the steel sets with their pigtails. I, I agree. I know sometimes just like the last house I lived in the kitchen cabinets were just the perfect height to grab my tubing. And it was so frustrating. Um, and then, yeah, John is saying that he finds the barrier and adhesive to help with the doorknobbing. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's like the term hashtag doorknobbing for diabetes. <sighs> Well, I think that's everything that everyone has asked. Thank you all so much for, for joining me on this Saturday. It's a little gloomy outside and getting chilly here today in Ohio, but I hope I hope I answered all of your questions and I really appreciate the participation and the comments and um, you know, thank you all for joining us. Please fill out the survey that's gonna come to your email after the session. And we also have a few, um, a few more donations that we need to get to our 100 to get the $25,000. So if you can check out um, the 100 years of insulin donation um, information on the website, that would be great. And please check out our uh, exhibit, the exhibit hall from our generous sponsors. We, we really appreciate you participating with us and have a great rest of your weekend.